Good morning. This morning we are continuing with our study of the Gospel of Mark, and we're on chapter 8 this morning, verses 34 through 38. Mark, chapter 8, verses 34 through 38. Go ahead and read this and then pray. Jesus called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny, reject himself, and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But if he loses his life for me and for the gospel, we will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, to have everything, yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him. Let's pray. Lord, if we don't understand, we ask that you help us. Give us wisdom. Make these words clear to us so that we do understand. Thank you for the time now to set aside our weekly schedules and to give all attention to you as you deserve. In Jesus' name, amen. Scripture itself, some of you have read this and are familiar with it, and it's interesting. Studying this, I thought, how often do we read something and we think we understand it, but we really don't? I mean, we understand it superficially, but we don't truly understand it yet. We need to understand it more deeply. There's more involved here. There's more meaning there. And that's what we need to focus on. It's almost like, you know, a good husband, you know, encouraging his wife when she has a baby, you know, go take time for yourself, rest, go. And of course, the mom says, sure, you know, she'll schedule time away. And as it gets closer, the husband says, well, who takes care of the kids? That's you. Oh, you know, he hadn't put the pieces together yet. He hadn't made that connection. You know, all the words and thoughts were nice, and he expressed them well. But if you go, then wait a minute. Who's going to take care of the kids? That's what we're talking about. And that's what our text this morning is kind of focusing on. There's more meaning behind it. Again, Jesus and his disciples were traveling. And let me back up a little bit. Jesus had asked them two questions in the previous passage. And, you know, he asked them several questions and we see them again. He asks his disciples, who do the people say I am? Because if you remember, the disciples said, well, some say you're John the Baptist. Others think you are the prophet Elijah. And others say that you're one of the other prophets. Okay, that's fine. That's what the people are thinking. Now, I want to ask you specifically, 
Who do you say I am? And Peter, assertively and boldly, that was his personality, answered, you are the Christ. You are the Christ. Meaning, you are the anointed one, the chosen one. You are the one. You are the one we have been waiting for since David ruled. We have been waiting and waiting for the Messiah to arrive, and there you are. Now, these disciples have been with him for two years. They've been traveling with him. They've been watching him work. They had paid attention to his teachings. They had seen everything, seen his miracles, and now God made it clear to them. He is the Christ. But did they fully understand what that meant? I am the Christ. What does that mean? The chosen one. Did they understand what the prophets had taught and explained in the past? Did they clearly understand that? Apparently not. Because what Jesus says next Peter and the other disciples were absolutely shocked. They couldn't believe it at what comes next. The Son of Man, meaning Jesus himself, must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed, killed. And after three days, rise again. You're Christ, we've been waiting for you and finally you're here. Well, do you know what that means? That means that I will have to suffer and die. Those are Jesus' words here. They seem simple, they seem clear. I have come here. I mean, some people thought that he would come with an army and push out Rome. And he said, no, that's not me. I have come. And why? I have come to suffer and die. And that is my father's purpose. Ever detail as to who will arrest me, who will reject me, and how I am to die. This is all part of his holy plan. And do you think I've come for you to serve me? No, I have come to serve you. And it's hard for us to envision the disciples' reaction. They were confused. But you are the Christ, the Messiah, the one that we have been waiting for who has finally come to free us. Well, well, wait a minute, time out. You say you're going to have to suffer and die and you're here to serve us? Obviously, they hadn't understood what Jesus had been teaching all along. Maybe they had misunderstood his instructions. And what Peter responds with in verse 32, basically, Lord, no way. You can't. I mean, I believe you're the Messiah, but for you to suffer and die, that's not our vision of the Christ. Peter completely misunderstood what the prophets had taught in the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 50. There's other chapters throughout as well. Zechariah. And you know, when Jesus responded, Peter said, that's impossible. And Jesus said, do you think I'm wrong? Do you understand my father's business better than me? Obviously, you, Peter, are not the one who's talking. Satan is talking through you. 
get out, Satan. And Satan had been trying to mess up God's plan. If we go back to the beginning of Jesus' ministry, when he was in the desert, if you remember, Jesus had gone to the desert for 40 days to fast, and Satan showed up and tried to persuade him and tempt him, tried to convince Jesus to give up on his ministry, to give up on the purpose that he was here on earth. And we see how Satan again is there through Peter. Well, it can't be, Lord. It can't be, Lord. No, no, that won't happen to you. I'll protect you. I'm here for you. And Jesus, of course, responded, get out, Satan. He knew who was doing the speaking there. He was manipulating his emotions. And Jesus instantly used those harsh words. They were rough. And this is the first time that we see Jesus really be rough with the disciples, really reprimand them, say, be done with this. But he needed to wake them up. They needed to understand what the word Messiah meant, what it meant that Jesus had come and why he had come and what was going to happen. He said, you must clearly understand. I have come to suffer. I have come to die for your sin. And we know the world out there does not understand that concept. He came to die for sin? That's foolish. That's foolish. God wants to save people. That means that he sent his son to die. That makes no sense. Who came up with that? But you know, if we confess in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we must understand, we must ex accept that he suffered for you and for me. The pain he experienced was for you and for me. But that also means he expects us to follow his example. Now, for the world, this is interesting. The world envisions following Jesus' example as meaning what? Being kind. Being nice. Showing mercy. Being a good person. Helping other people. That's the world's vision. When you follow Jesus, they think you mean, oh, you're a sweet person, a nice person. But what we see here, as Jesus explains it, is very different. If anyone would come after me, he must deny not deny this way, but it's to reject self. He must deny himself and take up his cross. And we'll talk about that in a minute. He must take up his cross and follow me. It doesn't say you must be kind, you must help other people. It's not there. Did you notice? And you need to understand something. The disciples had already left their homes. They had already left their families. They had already given up their jobs. They had sacrificed already for Jesus. Do you mean that's not enough? Apparently not. Now, Jesus is asking for more. Total commitment. Total sacrifice. Specifically, what is there? Again, he must deny himself. And what does that look like? That word in the Greek means disown. Disown. For example, 
If there's a family argument and the father declares, I disown my son, I disown my daughter, that means that our relationship is severed. You are out of the family. What used to be yours does not belong to you anymore. It's not yours. You have lost the family name. You have lost your family right and family privilege. So now, to reject oneself, deny, disown, that means, who am I rejecting? I'm rejecting myself. I'm rejecting myself, but I'm rejecting my wants, my needs, my ambition, my dreams are all gone. I've gotten rid of them all, and I'm now doing everything for him. Me, my, I is gone. It's all about him. And many people are willing to say, my life, Jesus, you're welcome into my life. Come on. Oh, yeah, I'd love to have Jesus. Yeah, follow me, Jesus. Come on. These are my plans, my goals, my dreams. And you go ahead and bless them. But we have to deny ourselves that my is gone. That word my is gone now. We follow Christ, and following Christ is not a part-time job. Some of your kids might be working part-time during the summer now, and they might be required to wear a uniform with their name badge. And they don't, they don't like those uniforms, right? They don't look good. They're ugly colors, you've got these ridiculous hats. But if I'm working, I go to work, and I'm in this uniform, we all look the same, so it's really not a problem, right? And to have my name badge there, eh, but we're all the same. I'll work my six or seven hours, and then when I'm done, when work is done, I'm gonna leave. But first, I've gotta get out of this uniform. I hate these this uniform. You know, if you're gonna go pick up your son or daughter from work, and you say, hey, you wanna go out to eat? No, I've gotta change my clothes first. And I thought about our faith. We are here with other Christians, which is fine. We're comfortable, we're socializing, we're talking about Jesus, it's all good. But tomorrow, when I go back to work, does that mean that my name tag that says I'm a Christian, am I gonna take that off? <coughs> Jesus said, if you follow me, it's not like a name tag that you can just put on and take off. You put it on and it stays on. You know, it's like it's branded into you. It stays permanently because that is who you are. That means if you follow him, he must rule over everything part of you. And if Jesus were to ask you to leave your family, he says, and he said, I need you to go. Or your nice job, I need you to leave that job. I have other plans for you. Your friends, <clears throat> your teachers, your, com your community, your comfortable home, let go of it. Or suppose Jesus made it clear, next year for vacation, you thought you were gonna have this comfortable retirement? No, I have plans for that money. I have plans for your time. Would you follow him? Would you really ask yourselves, would you follow? Suppose Jesus said, I know you don't want to share your faith within the community. 
It's hard. It's awkward. You don't like their expressions. But that is my plan for you. Because if anyone follows me, he must deny himself. Are you ready? This is not a test. Well, suppose if. I mean, this is real life. Jesus is now asking you, telling you, that if you want to follow me, you have to be ready to give up everything. Are you willing to tell Jesus, hey, uh, you can have whatever you want. Help yourself. Or are you going to say, well, you can have anything except for, I'm going to keep this. Or my reputation, I'm going to keep that. <clears throat> Follow me. If you follow me, then I expect you to give up where I become your focus. I am your goal. I become your everything. Then Jesus says, if anyone follows me, he must take up his cross. Okay, so does that mean I really need to go get this cross and carry it, walk around with it all day, every day? No. This is actually a metaphor to help us understand better what he's talking about. A metaphor means basically when he says, take up your cross, this is a burden. You have to accept this burden. Some people misunderstand and they think that it means any difficult burden that we face. For example, <clears throat> my spouse is not saved, so that is my cross. That is my burden. Or they could think it means, oh, my boss, I am always butting heads with my boss, but that is my cross. That is my burden. Or I have been struggling with illness. That is my cross. That is my burden. No. That's not what Jesus means here. All of those things, and could be different examples for burdens, yes, but when Jesus says you must take up your cross, that's not what he means. To carry the cross means that we must be willing to accept the consequences because we follow Jesus. You follow Jesus Christ, then you will face consequences. And that is your cross to carry. The consequences, for example, could be shame. How many of you have experienced your family saying to you, I'm ashamed of you? Embarrassment. Rejection, people shunning you. Persecution, death. For example, when we stand and declare John chapter 14, he is the way, the truth, and the life. What do you mean? Jesus himself is the only way the only truth and the only life. Oh, wait a minute. The community in the world isn't going to accept that. He's the only way? Oh, come on. You're judging. That's hatred. That's evil. The world does not accept truth. 
and they will challenge you. They will roll their eyes and they tell you that you're ridiculous. But if you follow Jesus, if you refuse to accept what the culture accepts, then we start to notice, well, my children used to be invited to all these parties and now they're not being invited. Are you ready for that? You know, I used to be invited to get-togethers, but now nobody's contacting me. Well, a few people do, but most of them don't. Are you ready for that? Because if we really follow Jesus, if we are willing to take up that cross, that means that we should expect it. No, we don't like it. We're not gonna be, we don't brag about it, but we expect it. It's part of what we do because we love the Lord with all our hearts, minds, and souls and strength. That means we, we want to become like Jesus. I mean, we talk about that often. We sing about it. I want to become like you. Well, Jesus suffered for our faith, so that means we will suffer for our faith as well. What do you think it means? I want to become like Jesus. Oh, but, but that suffering part? No, no, I don't want to suffer. Jesus came to suffer and die. Oh. Is that what that verse means? Yes. So does that mean that every believer who follows Jesus will be rejected by family and friends? No, it doesn't mean that, but it could happen. Does that mean that every believer, because they stand for Christ, might lose their job? No, but it could happen. Can we accept the consequences? Can we accept that cost? Scripture talks about counting the cost. If I am to follow Jesus, I will experience a cost. That is the consequence. But we believe that cost is too much or that we can't afford it. Do we think that? No, I mean, actually we have no choice. I have submitted my life. I have given you my life, my heart, my mind, my soul. Everything is yours. But now, I'm struggling with persecution, frustration, challenges. Uh, uh, no, is that what that really means? Verse 34. We follow, meaning that we obey, then we must, we have no choice. What are the options? Honestly, what's the option here? Ah, forget it. I don't plan to follow you today. Is that an option? Are you ready to give up Jesus? Are you ready to declare, my faith that I've had all along isn't real? We follow because we must. Jesus explained why in verse 35. Take a look at verse 35. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. Lose, save, what does that mean? To save your life means if your life here on earth is more important than your life with the Father. If you want this life here, if you are not willing to sacrifice all, heart, mind, actions, attitude, relationships, 
if you would rather keep your reputation, keep your community, follow your plans. Okay. But Jesus clearly says, you know, go ahead, think for yourself. But you're going to lose your life. Meaning, you will lose your soul. You will not spend eternity with me. Because what you hold on to may seem important right now, but it does, has no eternal value. It's worthless. Let's go to the next. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world? To have everything, yet forfeit his soul. His soul. Your soul. Are you going to trade that in? Can you do that? If you take a look here, kind of envision money. You know, pursuing the world, those who are chasing after the world, what does it mean here? For example, if you're going to pursue different causes, for example, equal rights, justice, animal rights, raising money for cancer, feeding hungry people, sending kids to camp, whatever cause it is, and there's nothing wrong with those activities. I'm not criticizing them. But the problem is, all of this work, who are you doing it for? Well, I'm helping people. This is good for children. I'm trying to make the world better. It makes me feel good. Okay, fine. But ultimately, what eternal value does it have? It has none. It doesn't last. It's a waste of time because that it's, you have to look at your motivation as to why you're doing it. It has nothing to do with him. And they lose their souls because they don't understand who they were created by. They were created by a God for God. Do you realize that every person here was created for him, meaning for his purpose, for his plan, for his pleasure? For his gospel, for the lost world out there. People want to gain the world. They want to have successful careers. They want to keep their reputation strong in the community. They want to see their children be popular. They want to have great retirement savings. But for what? All of these things are successful, then what? Because Jesus makes it clear, and again, we emphasize that each one of these things are not bad in themselves. But the question is, why are we pursuing these and not pursuing him first? For Jesus makes it clear, for us, I am asking for everything. For you, if you are ashamed of me, in verse 38, if you are ashamed of me, Jesus says, if you are ashamed of me, and the Greek there means that if you reject me. All right, that's fine, I'm telling you. I will reject you before the Father. That's fine, you can reject me, but I want to let you know, I will reject you as well. Clear enough? I know it's a little shocking there. Makes you think. I read this passage I don't know how many times. I can't count. 
But thank you, Lord, that this time, that is what Jesus meant means. Life for yourself, you will eventually lose everything. Or follow me. And finally, understand true life. Amen.